we have Amit Sharma here, who is a co-founder of eMedinexus. Uh, then we have uh, Sunil Thakur, who is the director and the chief operating officer for Quadria Capital. Then we have uh, Mr. Vivek Srivastava, who is the co-founder and CEO of Healthcare at Home. And then we have Soumya Kanti, who is the chief executive of Berkeley Health Edu. So welcome, uh, panelists. Uh, the discussion to, for today's uh, session is raising capital for your healthcare business needs, the raising capital for the healthcare ventures, understanding from which mediums one can raise the capital for building the hospitals, either by public sector banks, the financial institutions, or the public sector insurance companies. Whether to raise with the angel fund, seed capital, growth equity, or the venture capital. So the healthcare facility needs a very sophisticated infrastructure, the state of the art technology, competent doctors and professionals, paramedicals, nurses, highly integrated operating systems, and the referral hub and spoke model to attract the target customers to ensure the smooth cash flow. We have observed that sometimes the non-healthcare investors are entering into healthcare due to number one, maybe they are attracted by the healthcare corporates listed in the stock exchange. Maybe they are convinced by some of the leading medical professionals to invest into healthcare business on a partnership model due to the demand in the growing market or the increased penetration of the medical insurance. Or maybe they are advised by the transaction advisor or the business consultant. There are a couple of missing links here which could be finding the appropriate location for the facility. It could be not doing a proper TV, the techno-economic viability study for a particular project. There could be a fluctuating cost of the project, time and the cost overruns in the delays. Inability to attract the reputed doctors or the management team or to retain them. Inability to also control the growing cost and the wastages and the pilferages in the consumables and the pharmaceuticals. Time required, a clear understanding of the time required to reach the break-even point and the return on the investment. And also, shifting the focus from retaining talent to attracting talent. So this is the context in terms of the overall healthcare scenario. The doctors and the corporates and the professionals are looking at raising capital. So I would like to request each one of the speakers to give what do they think, what is the right way of raising the capital for a new healthcare hospital project? Then we'll do a deep diving into the other aspects of it. So uh, I'll start with Swamiya first. What is your uh, context on this? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, being a last session, I know it's, it's difficult uh, after a whole long day of very, very interesting discussions. Uh, but I want to share a, a few uh, different points here before we go into the details. Uh, yesterday I was in a uh, pure uh, investment uh, kind of summit uh, fundraising event in Bangalore and interestingly uh, like I said you know it was more angel funding and first stage funding, uh, seed capital funding not really the uh, series A, series B kind of funding and about 15 shortlisted uh, companies who are more just beyond startup stage were invited to present uh, to the entire audience who were more people who were uh, looking at funding the companies. And the interesting part I wanted to share with the panel and people here is that out of those 15 companies, only two were healthcare companies. Now, what does it really uh, convey? I mean, the two things which I felt could be the reason and then maybe the other panelists can uh, you know, share their thoughts on that, is that number one, the healthcare fund requirements are usually very high because it's very high infrastructure costs, equipment costs, etc. So maybe it is beyond this stage of funding where they really directly have to go to, to a high level of funding which is uh, in, in a very high uh, amount. The second thing and which is a matter of concern I think should be for everyone in the room is that is there enough innovation happening in this sector? Is everyone running after the hard stuff, the infrastructure, the, the uh, building, the equipment, the materials? What about the soft stuff? Because a lot of these companies who were presenting and, uh, and, and seeking funds were more, more focused on, you know, very innovative model of doing that particular type of business, whether it is education, whether it is, you know, web-based marketing, whether it is some of the healthcare uh, two things are there. 
So I think we need to uh, look inside and see how do we really uh, create more innovation in, in healthcare solutions. I think we have a couple of uh, panelists here who have uh, done uh, similar things. Uh, there are new sectors opening up into healthcare. How do we really get into that? And then based on really what is it that we are looking at? For example, we are a training company. So uh, relative to the size of requirements, our size is quite small because we don't invest. We are uh, relatively asset light. So we don't have huge infrastructure. We don't need very heavy equipment except for the training staff that we need. So based on that, our requirement for fund could be small and we could go to, you know, uh, seed capital funding, angel funding or first level of funding. But yes, if the requirements are very high, I think you, you need to go and see high level of funding requirement. But again, coming back, I think my, my request to the, the people here present and uh, the panelists are that we need to also see how we can create more innovative models, more bring in more innovation into healthcare so that we encourage more people to come up and create models which can really uh, disrupt the way we have been looking at healthcare. <coughs> so Vivek, uh, you know, you are uh, running a totally uh, 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 healthcare at home. So what has been your perspective in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the raising capital for such kind of ventures and uh, maybe, you know, uh, are hospitals uh, acceptable to this kind of a scenario of continuum of care going ahead at home? So yeah, so I think, uh, First of all, I have been on the investing side of it as well. Uh, I, you know, I invested for the Burman family and investment team, and in fact, started uh, Berkeley Health Edu uh, and Healthcare at Home. So, you know, I have seen the investing side of it. And uh, to your question on, uh, you know, this model being accepted by by uh, hospitals, it is being, ex uh, you know, ex uh, accepted by the hospitals. So, we when we started, uh, we immediately got some traction from certain hospitals because. Clearly, if you see, uh, as Swami <coughs> was saying, that there have to be new models which have to come into place. And, you know, in India, if you see the healthcare investment which would be required <coughs> to raise the number of beds from where it is right now, let's say about 0.7 to 1 bed per thousand population, taking it to a much higher number as per WHO standard, it's clearly not possible because of the amount of money it will require and the amount of time it will require. So you have to have innovative models to be able to, you know, change this or let the requirement not be there. Where is the bed? It's there in the home of people. So that's, you're utilizing the existing capacity which is available already and use that to deliver services and hence reduce the actual requirement of building so many hospitals. It's happened in the West that hospitals, uh, so UK for example, the hospital beds are being reduced and more and more care is given into the community uh, so that uh, you know you reduce the costs uh, of, of providing healthcare and also it's it's more convenient for the patient. The same thing happens for the doctors as well. You are able to increase the capacity of the doctors because the same doctor will focus now on very critical patients and the routine patients will go in in home and that's how we have been able to get the hospitals also to believe that you know this can act this is not actually competing with the hospitals. This actually creating more com capacity for the hospital. So if a hospital is located in a particular area, the catchment area could potentially before us would have been five, 10 kilometers or so. But eventually, uh, you know, if, if the hospital ties up with us, we could go 200 kilometers. So we could do a chemotherapy for a Rajiv Gandhi cancer hospital where people come in from, let's say Punjab or Aligarh, uh, and we can go and deliver that chemotherapy in, in that uh, area rather than people traveling. And we have done that. So we have done that for multiple hospitals. You know, these days, if you go to ICUs, they are all choked. You know, big corporate hospitals are choked with uh, in their ICU capacity. And uh, if you are able to release that capacity, that increases the average revenue per occupied bed for the hospital. And for the consumer also, it's beneficial because our ICUs would be at 50% to the cost of the hospital. So, so that. That's why these have, you know, they, they have accepted it. Uh, of course, it takes time for you to uh, to explain the concept for people. Some people get it faster than the others, uh, and and yeah, so that's that's been our story so far. Yeah, Sunil, uh, uh, would like to have your perspective on the, the from the investment uh, side as to what is your take and what is your advice on that. Yeah, so uh, you know, I come from the investment side, and, and just to give you a background, uh, uh, I'm a part of uh, Quadria Capital, which is a a specialist uh, healthcare focused fund. So we invest in hospital chains and we invest, so we invest in delivery services, we invest in pharma companies, medical devices and associated services with respect to healthcare. 
and we meet uh, lots of companies who are seeking capital and and our our uh, view on this is that you know the source of capital depends on on the stage at which you're looking to raise capital so if it's your first hospital unfortunately in india you know the market is not so evolved that venture capital or private equity would come forward and and help and support you so the first source of money has to be your own <coughs> source of money the second source of money has to be your friends and family the third source of money has to be banks so you know you basically <coughs> end there and then before you move to an external formal source of funding on the equity side you have to have a proof of concept which is a successful hospital model that venture capital or private equity fund <coughs> those kind of models happen is because the market or the investor gets the confidence that this particular star doctor can on day 1 attract the business of 75 crores to 100 crores to 150 crores so if there is a confidence in you that you can pull together on day 1 a business such as that then you you can get venture capitalist or private equity investors to fund you but then there are ways and means for an investor to check how you will be able to do it which is your current practice otherwise you know since the topic is hospital hospital has a very straight jacketed approach in india there are no novelties when it comes to hospital unlike other services model where you can create a you know a, a separate business model uh, you know unlike pharma companies where you can have a separate business model or devices hospital are generally straight jacketed so that's my take on how funding happen in india yeah amit you have been uh Uh, on the equity side funding side also and you've been on the the operator side as well and also into many uh, many other e platforms so i just wanted your context on this particular yeah uh, sure absolutely i'll come on it from three different angles because i'm doing three things right now one is i'm advising uh, i am in the bad on the upcoming bharat fund for their health strategy which is digital health and med devices i'm also um, working with an mnc uh, med device player to help them with their tier 2 tier 3 strategy and i'm also running email nexus which is a doctor platform about 10% of india's doctors on board more focused on training doctors actually uh, let me do a quick couple of minutes on on devices and digital which is sort of the tech side and then get towards the more meaty component of basically the asset space which we're all actually talking about So digital health is a relatively new segment uh, effectively what we've seen happen here is a lot of copy pasting from what's happening in the US I mean you know for lack of better uh, you know to be completely transparent I basically tried to launch Doximity in India uh Practo launched Zocdoc um you know I I can go on and on right uh, telemedicine plays etc uh you know it's a very new market we've seen about 2.5 billion dollars invested in the space already within about a four year period um my valuation of the market which breaks down in terms of a few different components which is your healthcare consumer engagement which is the largest one fair administration <laughs> care coordination uh then your effectively um you know more telemedicine oriented platforms and then finally your other sort of distributed platforms this is a uh, uh, tautology that i'm borrowing from rock health which is an incubator in america which is very advanced in looking at digital health um you know great market if anyone out here including doctors wants to look at it because your your go no go is something that within 6 months of operating you'll actually figure that out am i getting traction can i get revenues is somebody going to fund me do i even require funding you require very low quantums of funding to be able to do something digitally the rooms wide open at the same time if i were to take four markets which i take statista and borrow something from them uh they effectively sized up the size of the the diabetes the fitness the hypertension and the cardiology markets in india in terms of revenues it's only about 200 million dollars okay we're talking about a 4 billion dollar market with 200 million dollars in revenue let me be generous and multiply that by 2 that's a 10x multiple there's a major gap in valuation over there number 1 getting on to devices it's a 4 billion dollar space in india you're in that space as well via philips uh of course we've got uh you know the major segments within that being effectively um your uh, <coughs> uh sort of uh equipments your electrocardiograms and your your other equipments then we've got our our basic diagnostic radiology oriented things then we've got a couple of other kind of components within it the level of innovation we've seen in india has been fairly low because you know we've been a bit slow on coming up with our domestic regulation regime which is the med devices sort of regulation bill for india which lays out clinical trial regimes for india in addition to allowing a lot of support from the government for the sector to flourish uh i won't get too much into devices because we're talking about hospitals now you know complementing what uh, um uh, was being said by 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 my colleague here from quadria capital 
Uh, you know, you do have options in terms of debt versus equity. As doctors who are starting up their first facility, you're only going to get debt, right? It really boils down to you have to be very judicious when you talk to banks in terms of what interest rate am I closing that debt on? I mean, you know, I've worked with hospitals when I was at Hosmac and otherwise, which had debt of 18% on their books, right? Now, what's your cost of capital when you're looking at equity? 25% or so, right? So the delta between that is significant, so it's always more expensive to go for equity. But as he said, there's a premium to scale. You're not going to have one facility, even if it's EBITDA break even, you're not going to be able to raise uh, equity funding on the basis of that. You're not going to be able to do a franchise model. Some of the guys in the single specialty space are starting to do that. Multi-specialty hospitals have been much more proven. They've reached scale. They've gone through an exit cycle for private equity investors as well. Single specialty hospitals have not. Okay, so that's a new space that we're looking at. And typically the types of kind of models that we exceed have been the lower capital uh, expenditure ones, which include dental, ophthal, maternal. Now it's getting a little bit into nephrology, dialysis, et cetera. Of course, certain modalities like transplant medicine, cardiology, you can only do that via multi-specialty hospital because you need a feeder and there's you know, a high cost structure around that. Um, you know, so I would say that you, know, you need to really understand your unit economics and how you can actually project that in one to two places. In fact, earlier a lot of doctors came and said, look, I have one facility, I want to set up another facility, can I raise some PE funding for that? You know, just as you know, he's also mentioned, it would be very difficult, but what you might want to do is try to get into an operating partnership with someone and say that, look, you, know, you have a coal shell or you, you're a construction company, you need a health facility in your space, these are the thrust areas that I can provide you, I'll staff it. Let me take it on some sort of an operational fee, build that, do one, two, three, and you know, mind you, Fortis, Narayan, Rudelia, all these people have predominantly, you know, I mean, post the deleveraging that they've seen because they've really expanded into kind of greenfield all over the country and then kind of had to retrench back, but they've predominantly done things through management contracts as well. So I'd strongly encourage people to think of these leaner modalities when they're in their initial stages. And then once you hit that seven, five, seven hospitals, two, three hospitals even at the 200 bed plus range, then by all means, go for private equity. But you know, in hospitals, there's a limited number of, uh, there's too many investment bankers who are gonna be shoving the same deals up to the same funds that pushes up the valuations. It's very difficult at times to deal with doctors in terms of these sort of negotiations. Um, but once you cross that scale, you know, you, you certainly have that option. So basically what I understand is uh, if you are a, a single hospital and you want just one more hospital to add up or you are just looking at a normal organic growth, the, the cheaper option would be to just raise a debt or a equity from the family and friends and then do that scaling yourself with the, some of the nationalized bank doing the funding for the entire project. If you're looking at a quantum jump, you have a proven track record and proof points and you're looking at multiple uh, you know, uh, growth plans, in that case, private equity option can be explored, but as you know, Amit said, private equity is definitely a more expensive money than the debt. But then definitely, you know, it also brings in a lot of value because when the private equity guys come on board, they bring in a lot of financial discipline in the organization. They also bring in a lot of outside in perspective to run the businesses, which generally is not happening in a single uh, hospital or a twin hospital kind of setup. But then uh, along with that, uh, I would like to also uh, hear from Sunit as to when they are looking at the potential hospitals whom they have to invest in, what you typically look at in those hospitals, not just the balance sheet, something beyond that. Yeah, so there are a couple of, uh, you know, matrices that we look at uh, and it starts with, you know, the theme that we want to go with. A uh, couple of examples that we can, uh, I can give you about, you know, uh, some of the investments that we've done. Uh, you know, from our past fund, we were investors in HCG uh, and, and we are very positive about single speciality. So HCG is now India's number one oncology company. We've exited, uh, you know, the company went IPO'd, IPO'd uh, last, last year and we sold our stake. Uh, we were very bullish on, on Eastern India and, and there were a few facts, uh, you know, one is the population. Uh, the population of that particular region is about 550 million. Uh, because I, I consider Bangladesh to be part of that. So if you, 350 of Eastern India plus Northeast, 45 million plus 150 of Bangladesh will take us to 500. Now you can imagine the kind of population okay. that we're catering to. There was a paucity of, there is still a paucity of uh, proper infrastructure, whereas you have talents who are from Eastern U Eastern India who are practicing outside of Eastern India. So the, the theme was falling in place, low competition, high need for infrastructure, and uh, you know, a uh, well-evolved population, high-paying uh, customer base, people from Patna, Ranchi, 
Calcutta, Jamshedpur, they travel to Delhi, they come to Medanta, Fortresses and the Maxis of the world. If you are able to provide a similar infrastructure in that part of the country, you will be able to basically uh, get the talent pool because of reverse migration, what India is to the world is Eastern India <coughs> to, to India. So you have talented doctors out of Patna, <laughs> Ranchi, sorry, <laughs> Calcutta. You can source those clinical uh, talent back to their home country, uh, back to their hometown. You have high paying customers, or I shouldn't say high paying customers, but you know, decent, you know, upper middle class, affordable. high class, aff affordable, yeah, uh, who can afford that kind of, uh, uh, that, that kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, service. The rest, everything is a function of money, which is good quality infrastructure, good equipment. So if you put all those pieces together and plonk it in a market like Eastern India, it, it becomes a very attractive theme. And that is what we did when we invested in a company called Medica. Uh, Medica is now Eastern India's largest hospital network. We have uh, presence in seven locations across Eastern India. We went about investing in a, uh, in a single speciality again. This was a gastroenterology hospital called Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. That hospital does about 400 endoscopies a day. It's a referral center. There is not even a single salesperson in that hospital. There is no referral fees paid to any doctor across, across the country. 45% of the patient <coughs> comes from outside of Hyderabad. So again, our positiveness on, on, on positive view on, on single speciality. So we look at the theme, that's the overarching arching thing. Then we look at, the, we do the demand analysis, uh, we look at the current size and obviously the, the, uh, the growth trajectory. So these are the certain matrices that we look at. Then obviously, you know, given the size that we have, we have about $500 million to deploy. There is a, there is a limit, you know, there is a limitation in terms of, you know, what, what is the bare minimum that we can put in and what is the maximum that we can put in. So depending, so we know we generally put in about 40 to 50 million dollars in one, uh, one uh, investment, uh, which basically if you do a backward calculation, the hospital has to be of some size. So these are the matrices that we generally look at when we go about uh, making investments. Right. Thank you. Uh, Vivek, uh, what is your perspective from the invest as an investor on this, you know? Um, you have been on the investor side as well. So what is your perspective when you look at a typical some hospital trying to raise a private equity or a fund for the new setup? What is your take? What do you look at? So I think uh, when I was on the investing side, we were not as large as the uh, Sunil's capital size was. So we were very, you know, we were looking at very early stage things. Uh, and uh, at that point of time, our view on the multi-speciality uh, side was that <coughs> that's for the big boys. I mean, you can't, if you have to invest smaller capital, you can't have, uh, you know, uh, be investing into a multi-speciality hospital, whether it's standalone or, or across. So we were looking at uh, small niche things and that's why you know investment into healthcare at home or uh, you know health healthcare healthcare education as well uh, we also looked at some uh, you know single specialty uh, you know uh, investments because there the capital required is low the return on uh, investment uh, is is potentially higher uh, of course the capital requirement is lower and you could do it in the early stage as uh, you know amit was saying that you know, those are the capital, you know, models where there you have seen more funding as compared, uh, you know, a over the last uh, few years as well. So those, those were the first gating items for us that, you know, it has to be um, in the earlier stage and it has to be not a real estate play uh, largely because many of the hospitals require <coughs> a lot of money just to, you know, just for the real estate itself. And that's something, you know, you'd rather invest in real estate separately than invest in a hospital. So we were looking at smaller deals. So I think the uh, the way we looked at it is what are the needs which you can see not only now but over you know over a period of uh, you know the next decades or two because that's how the family the Burman family wanted to invest they wanted to invest in something which is very new but you know uh, and there was no exit horizon of three years five years they were looking at investing for generations right so that next generation of Burman family could earn benefit. So that's how they were investing. So they could uh, enter in early in a very new concept and make it big in India, but restrict it to lower capital requirements. Amit, what is your, uh, you know, uh, take on that? Sure, sure. Uh, so when we were at Warburg, we were looking at larger $500 million plus ticket sizes, leverage buyouts, et cetera. There's, you know, a couple of companies, maybe five companies in India that are at the scale that could support that. I'm not going to talk about that range because Effectively, you would look at private investments in public equity and, you know, the list of publicly listed 
uh, healthcare companies in the hospital space is probably, correct me if I'm wrong, under 20, right? And you have a couple of single specialty, Dr. Agarwal's eye care, Lotus eye care is also public list, HCG, right? Um, and you know, we've seen some good movement in diagnostics, but let's focus for a minute on, on uh, you know, uh, hospitals and let's talk maybe, I'll just talk a little bit about the five to $20 million funding range, which is slightly lower than what he was addressing as well. You know, what you really wanna see is one or two things. Number one is the replicability of your unit economics. So how quickly did you break even on your first setup? How fast did you get it off the ground? Uh, what operating <coughs> partnerships did you put in place so that you were actually able to break even on EBITDA very fast and make it something that you could actually replicate? And when I say replication, I'll give you an example, right? Let's take ortho as a space, right? We know that trauma, spine, ortho, huge space, massive requirement in India, but why is that segment not scaled? Right, we've got Princeton Shalby Hospital yeah. in Gujarat, fantastic hospital, really, really amazing. I mean, the number of hips, hip replacement and you know knee, 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 surgery, surgery, yeah. knee replacement surgery, yeah. et cetera, they're popping out is at really, really high levels. Unfortunately, he's not able to replicate that model. Why? Because Gujarat operates under a model where almost 90% of your uh, fees are going to doctors, right? As opposed to let's say Delhi, where it's about 70% or so. Uh, we're not able to get you know that replicated. So manpower, as we discussed earlier, is a big, big, big sort of uh, problem. Second place where a lot of people get into, uh, you know, uh, what I said earlier is look for operating partnerships where you can take something over. At the same time, you need a particular scale for that. Nobody's gonna just say, Ke aap, you know, Gorakhpur ya kahin pe hospital chala rahe ho, to aap yahan pe bhi aake kar do. You need some sort of arrangements around around doing that as well. So what I would also mention is that the the very detailed kind of micro of your operations, your IP to OP conversion ratio, your interdepartmental sort of flow, your OT utilization, super major, major, minor, what's the mix, et cetera. Uh, what are the other types of locations that you're actually looking at? You know, are they kind of similar in terms of those characteristics of you know, your catchment areas, et cetera, and the service mix that they're demanding? If they're not, how are you customizing your business plan? Um, but you know, I think that there's a, a lot of room uh, for, for growth on the asset side. Uh, increasingly though, what we're starting to see is, and we do have a robust set of com uh, you know, enterprises that are, that are at that medium range, you know, your Metro Group, your Park Group, your Ivy Hospitals in Chandigarh, your, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a number of them that are growing, you know, and they're looking, Ivy for example, is looking at Batinda, Hushyarpur, where I'm from, you know, my, my mom's side of the family is from, uh, they're looking at, you know, Patiala, and all these markets that erstwhile other people haven't looked at. I'm very bullish on tier two, tier threes, simply because of the fact that, you know, if I have a one crore per bed uh, sort of cost in a tier one city, I can bring that down to almost 60 lakhs a bed, right, in a tier two. Uh, incentivization of manpower is a little bit more difficult there, but maybe if I pair myself down to more a secondary care hospital where I can actually refer patients externally, I can start looking at things. So I think there's ample room for flexibility on, you know, on trying out new business models. Um, and uh, you know there will be players that keep growing, but this asset side is a slow burn space, and the bigger you get, the more it's gonna actually become uh, you know, a, a kind of valuation game that goes on with the, with the large uh, sort of funds. At the same time, uh, what's also really important is to be you know, kind of sharp on your elbows as an entrepreneur to get into those types of agreements that may give you leverage in terms of scale. Everyone wants to see scale, and you're replicating your model and good financials everybody loves. If not good financials, good operations that can be rejigged somehow. And uh, India's a big market, there's, there's a lot of exciting things happening. The other thing that you should really recognize is, look, you know, if I'm a single hospital, I have a really prime location, I'm not able to raise equity funds, what do I do, <coughs> right? I maybe don't wanna run this my whole life, I don't have a succession plan, what can I do? In any sort of situation, there are three ways that you exit a private equity deal. One is you list a company, the other is you sell it to someone, the third is you, um, you know, effectively do a promoter buyback, right, of some stake or something, right? Selling to a strategic is very, very uh, interesting or, for, you know, giving an operating partnership for your facility to a strategic because you're getting that cash flow and I can guarantee you that within 10 years of an operating agreement, you can almost make back your entire money on that investment and then start having a positive operating cash flow as well. So let's not, you know, if, if funding isn't coming to us, you know, and that's the most depressing thing as an entrepreneur that, oh my God, I don't have it, what do I do, things are so bad I can't scale. Think outside the box if you have to and look at these options because you will get a premium from strategic, which you're not gonna get from funds because a fund needs to pay his LPs first, then he needs to pay his GPs, then, <laughs> 
he's going to sell his uh, stake in that, then he's going to take 20% on the carry. So the, you know, there's, there's a lot that they need on their sort of table, on their side of the table, which, you know, in a negotiation with the strategic is not going to be the same. Yeah, we'll come back to again on this topic, but before that, you know, you touched upon a very important point that as money is a resource, manpower is again a very important resource, particularly when you go down to tier two, tier three city. Since we have Swami here, will you know uh, ask us and uh, you know uh, advise us to you know how does the hospital besides arranging for the capital? I'm slightly deviating from the topic, but then quickly, if you can just share your views on you know how do we uh, scale up on the manpower skill sets, particularly in the tier two, tier three cities. See, what uh, is happening is that, of course, I mean, one of the key requirements, and I think it's been mentioned before also, and now, and, and we heard some of the uh, uh, people from the audience also ask, is manpower. Because what we see the, the kind of people coming out from our education system and what is expected in the corporate hospital, especially the ones which are looking for funding or which are requiring to scale, there's a huge gap. Yeah. And that is a gap which needs to be filled. And the hospitals are spending time and energy in sending this stuff to the training program. They are spending their own internal resources, the senior doctors they have hired. And that is where I think uh, companies like us can add a lot of value in terms of creating those trained resources, giving the trained resources to the hospitals either when they start. So we work a lot with Greenfield hospitals, you know, hospitals which are starting up. And when they start up, a lot of key resource comes from the training of the manpower and they can then come and like we say, hit the ground running because they don't need to go through the whole six, eight months of induction program, the training programs where big hospitals need to uh, send their people to. So whether it is the nursing staff, because what we realize is that 80 to 85 percent of the touch point for a patient is the nursing staff. Yeah. And, and that is where a lot of gaps exist because of course the doctors, the, the brands are there, the doctors are taking care of the patients, but a day to day impact on the patient, whether it is the, the uh, infection or, you know, the, the post-operative care or any of those other aspects of the healthcare are from those uh, uh, paramedical staff, the uh, nursing staff and all the other associated team. And a lot of training which goes into that really help in stabilizing the system, especially when you are starting fresh and also on the existing manpower because we all know there is a 60 percent plus attrition rate of manpower in the hospitals today and that is the biggest. Uh, issue which most of the hospitals are facing, especially when they want to grow or when they want to even stabilize their operations. And training becomes a very key aspect of retention of manpower. Yeah. Because a lot of staff that we interact with leave the hospitals because they don't really see it as a career. They come in, they earn some money, somebody pays better, they just move on. But when they see that the hospital has a, a career for them, has a uh, training path ahead of them, they really uh, find a value being added to them and they decide to stay on and that's where training and manpower development yeah. plays a very key role. Yeah, definitely. Coming back to our topic on the, the investment part, uh, most of the hospitals I've interacted with, most of the hospital promoters, they're not very clear as to what they want. They say, we want to raise capital for uh, setting up a hospital. They don't un know, understand, they don't understand the cycle of the private equity. They don't understand what is the life of the fund, what is the actual life of the fund, how much time do they have to scale up how they're going to give the exit to the fund, how they want to grow, maybe the organic way, the inorganic way. So I want Sunil to uh, take us through, you know, and explain to the audience in brief as to what is this private equity cycle about so that we have some clarity as to how does a, a hospital promoter look at the equity fund. Also, the, you know, sometimes the ticket size, as you said, you know, somebody is looking at a very small ticket size, somebody is looking at a very high ticket size. For somebody, 10 million may be a very, very big investment. For somebody, 10, may not, 10 million may not be uh, an interesting investment at all. Again, uh, coming back, for somebody, you know, single specialty would be making more say, business sense. Maybe multi specialty for somebody else would make more sense. Maybe diagnostic for someone would make uh, more attractive sense. So, just, you know, wanted to have your perspective as to what is the typical uh, uh, life of the fund and what is the, uh, the ways of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, which, which a hospital promoter has to have clarity in his mind. Sometimes, you know, people are approaching the private equity fund which are not healthcare focused. And they're giving mandate to somebody who does not know much domain knowledge on the healthcare and they're trying to, you know, have a discussion for six, eight months and finally realize the fund itself is not having a focus on healthcare and maybe not having a focus in the tier two, tier three cities or the space you are playing in. So just wanted to have your views on that, Sweet. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> private equ equity is, is, is basically a, a pooled capital through uh, through private sources. Uh, so, and the private source could be institutions, it could be uh, individuals. Uh, in our case, uh, you know, uh, we've raised money from glo global institutions. 
uh, and it's a foreign fund uh, and we have investors from you know from all across the world who basically given us commitment of a certain amount uh, and and uh, they've given a commitment to a team that they think understands healthcare and they will go about deploying uh, the money so you know our mandate is to invest in the healthcare sector across south asia and southeast asia now the way it works is it's an equity investment into a company unlike uh, unlike uh, you know the bank funding where uh, it has a particular tenor it has a particular cost which is fixed uh, so you can take the money from the bank uh, uh, you know so if it's, it could be a seven year loan or it could be a 10 year loan and you pay it back depending on you know what what structure you agreed with the bank and there is an interest cost uh, and a plus moratorium if you have one uh, in private equity since, since it's an equity investment uh, in the true sense of private equity uh, uh, they don't ask for any collaterals unlike banks which would take collaterals that would be in the form of the assets that you own or could be personal guarantee <coughs> a private equity in a true sense would not ask for collaterals uh, because they are taking an equity bet uh, and they pay some value it could be premium in most cases it, it is a premium uh, on the asset uh, but because you know our any private equity has a fund life that fund life could be for seven years could be for 10 years could be for 12 years which means that the investor, if he's given commitment to me as a fund, that I'm going to deploy money in your fund on day zero, then they need to take back the money or get back their money after 10 years, if, it's a, if, if the term of the, of the fund is 10 years. So the way we go about deploying fund is when we invest, we generally have contractual rights to seek exit after a certain period of time, the standard time that one has within India is, is around about five years, it could be four years, it could be six years, seven years. <coughs> so there is a time limit for an investment. So when you seek private equity or a venture capital, uh, you have to keep in mind that it, it comes in for a particular tenor, five years, six years, seven years. Now the private equity or a VC capital uh, investor would expect certain kind of return. Ideally, in the true sense, the returns should come from the growth of the business. <laughs> and obviously, you know, if somebody is invested in at a particular point of time when the business was doing, say, 50 crores of profit and the value was, say, 500 crores, then the reason why the investment was made was because the investor would have thought that the 50 crores is going to go to 200 crores. And if you apl apply the same multiple, it becomes 2,000 crores. So after five years, you know, the 500 crore worth of uh, you know, asset becomes 2,000 crore. So my value automatically becomes 4x of what, four times of what I've invested. So then I should go and sell it to somebody. Uh, so the, the way the contracts are going to be done is that, you know, the, the company and the promoter will be forced to provide me an exit after five years. And there is a waterfall, what we call as waterfall, which is in an ideal situation, uh, you know, we would want to take the company to the public, which is uh, do an IPO. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then we would want the right to, to get the company to help us exit, which means sell our stake to another private equity investor or to another investor. If that doesn't happen, then, you know, we would seek the right to sell it to a strategic investor. A strategic investor means another hospital company or a healthcare company. If that doesn't happen, then we will request <coughs> the company to buy back our share. If that also doesn't happen, we start becoming draconian. <laughs> we, we, because you know, for us it's important. It is not that the fund wants to operate that way. Our commitment is to the investor who's put the money behind and us. And what is the typical IRR you look at in when you invest in such? Uh, yeah, typical IRR in, in, a, in an emerging market, uh, we generally look at anywhere in, in the ballpark of 25%. 30 percent, 35 percent, depends on the stage of the, it, so you can take as 25 percent, yeah. there, are, there are lots of ifs and buts, very mature asset, you know, if somebody was to invest, invest in Medanta, I'm sure you know, they can't be expecting 25, 30 percent, right, right. they should be happy with 30 percent, because then the, the variation or the, the standard deviation in terms of, you know, uh, the numbers becomes less because there is the proven model, you know, all of that. So typically that's the way the private equity investors operate. So, but that's the true sense of private equity. But the way it operates in India and other emerging markets is that it's more like a convertible 
<laughs> said, which is, you know, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, restrictions which are put on the promoter. Uh, so if you're taking capital from an external party, uh, then, you know, you will have to give away lots of rights. You can't take major decisions without the consent of the investor. You will have to provide an exit to the investor. It could come by way of even a put option, which means that you might have to buy back yeah. the shares of the investor. But so these are typical, typical uh, rights. You know, Sunil, I'll add to that, you know, also it also brings in a lot of compliances in the, the setups. Yeah. So I think you know that uh, one positive that uh, thing that happens along with the other uh, uh, the amount you get for the growth is also because of the the domain knowledge of the investors a lot of compliances are put in place because most of the smaller hospitals and all that they are not following those uh, things not it's not that they don't want to follow but then they've been operating in a very smaller scale so with the investor coming in definitely a lot of compliances fall into the place. See the private equity uh, or a VC is actually meant for somebody who truly aspires to build an institution. Uh, you know, it is, it is actually, it doesn't fit, you know, uh, 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 a thought process where you just want to make money. Because making money and since, you know, it's a hospital platform, you know, there are lots of ways of making money. Making money could mean, mean making money outside of the hospital and making money mean making inside of the hospital. You take a cut on the pharma, you take a cut on the medical equipment, you know how many cuts are there in, in, in this healthcare industry. So that is also making money. But those are not compliant. So if you truly want to build an institution, you know, private equity will certainly help you. And that is the point that Prashant is trying to yeah. make, which is compliance. Compliance in true sense. Now, compliance can be really burdensome. And you feel that, yeah, why am I doing all this compliance? In the end, you know, just like NABH, if you actually follow, most of us take NABH as, you know, as a, as a, as a hindrance in what we are trying to achieve. But actually, if you take it in a positive way, it, it helps the organization, or JCI for that matter. So Amit, you know, you've been uh, in, in your earlier role with Warburg Pinkers, you have uh, been investing in Metropolis and you've been interacting with the, the team there. What is your take, you know, just slight shift, you know, uh, hospital versus diagnostic centers? Yeah. What has been your experience in terms of, definitely ABP yeah, knows. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to disclose the Metropolis deal, I myself wasn't involved in it, but we were all very kind of linked <laughs> up in our quarterly and annual meetings on this. Um, I will say one thing about having look at, looked at the diagnostic space in India very, very closely from a funding standpoint, that there's been a seismic shift in the last two years with how the growth of the uh, diagnostic industry is going to actually go. And, also, and, and the reason for that is because we've now seen some publicly listed entities. Diagnostics has notoriously been uh, the orphan child in terms of funding because there's a lot of kind of room for Hera Peri, okay, in terms of you know, referral fees from doctors, et cetera, especially radiology. So let's be very frank. Now, when we saw the second best IPO in the history of India come out with Hydrocare's uh, yeah. IPO, yeah. you know, we suddenly said, look, the eagle has landed. Now we have some, yeah, we have a true market. And there are a lot of <coughs> players at that mid-range. There's high tech, there's Vijaya, there's Medall, there's guys all across the country. Now, why were they not able to raise funds for the last five to six years? I'll tell you why, because they all had unrealistic valuation expectations pegged by private equity investors who said, let me pay 18x, 25x EBITDA for Dr. Lal's bath labs, let me pay 20x EBITDA for Metropolis, right? Now every small guy who's in the 200 crore range in terms of his valuation suddenly like, you know, you know, invest in me on 20x terms, right? And, and people are like, look, this doesn't work out. And then what you saw was a lot of the diagnostics players said, look, hum kya karne wale? either we're gonna have centralized laboratories and build scale and go to the smaller hospitals and kind of put collection depots and come up with a more sort of decentralized model for growth, or we're gonna look international. And we saw a lot of guys, Metropolis went international in Nigeria and you know, a lot of other areas in, 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 uh, in Africa. And you know, what's really happened now with Dr. Lal's, with Hydrocare, et cetera, is it's a huge boon for the industry. Because as we know, it's a very unregulated market. Quality is kind of not even a concern in diagnostics, but it is super scalable. Because once you build kind of one facility, you can actually operate Pan India through that in terms of your CapEx, right? And obviously subject to upgradation of that, et cetera. I'm extremely bullish on that. I think there's gonna be a huge wave of mergers and acquisitions that happen in the next one to one and a half years. In fact, the same promoters of the companies that are now public have been eyeing these same companies for a while and now they're gonna be bought on more realistic valuations. But that's a smaller market. We're talking about a hospital market which makes up 75% of the revenues of the yeah. healthcare industry. Yeah. And it's about an 80 to $100 billion industry. Diagnostic services is about a four to five $6 billion industry. It's an input into sort of healthcare. 
Uh, there's the hospital diagnostics model. There's the you know standalone sort of diagnostics model. I am extremely bullish on diagnostics. I, I would, I'm sure everybody here would share the opinion with me because it's such a scalable model, right? Uh, you don't need an extra facility to be able to go and operate in Jharkhand or to do this or that. Radiology is slightly different. Uh, and the reason it's different is because CapEx is higher and your margins are lower. At the same time, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very high need of the hour because we've got maybe six per 10,000 or 100,000 In fact, there's one more MRI machines. Way, you know, in the pathology, the sample travels. In the radiology, yes. the patient actually has to come to the center exactly. and be present there exactly. in the center for the scanning. So that is a mm -hmm. you know, typical scalability issue or the ra revenue ramp up issue when it happens. It's typically you know, anywhere in the village or a home collection, you can get a sample to come to your lab. But the, for doing an MR or a CT scan, the patient physically has to come to your center. Yeah. So definitely there's a shoe of scalability. It cannot happen to that scale, a lab can scale up. So yeah. Definitely that is one challenge. Again, CapEx is another challenge you definitely uh, you know, uh, talked about. Uh, for the hospitals who are trying to raise a fund, a typical uh, structure could be if you are uh, 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 trying to raise a fund, you can look at the typical vanilla model of raising debt and now get the entire project financed through uh, some of the nationalized banks. If you're a standalone set up a couple of hospitals, setting up a new hospital, the various OEMs, you know, like uh, Philips, G, Siemens, they have their own financial arm wherein they can fund in your equipments, maybe on a lease model or maybe a paper use <coughs> model or a debt model. So the equipment could be financed through that route as well. If you have, you know, a bigger ambition plan of scaling up, having multiple hospitals and have a proven tech track record, you can look at, you know, the, the uh, private equity route, but then have very clear thing in mind that you know, okay, this is a way wherein if you're really looking at a quantum jump, then private equity is the route to take. So there are various models available. There are options like paper use, there are options like PPP, wherein uh, the players are interacting with the government oh, yeah. and trying to you know, uh, make healthcare more affordable and scalable. So more and more models are coming up and uh, uh, globally, you know, the, the, the things are driven in that way wherein the scalability has to be considered whenever we are putting up a project. Scalability, you know, having the standard operations, replicability, these are the issues, you know, which we typically face when people are ramping up. Will I be able to provide the same level of care which I am providing in my flagship hospital to a, a tier 3 hospital? Will I be able to attract the same kind of talent in my flagship hospital which, you know, I can get the same kind of talent in a tier 2, tier 3 setup? So those are the issues and the challenges we need to struggle with. And, uh, you know, I'd now like to, you know, open the forum for the questions. We have five to seven minutes more left. So I would encourage questions from the audience on this. Yeah, please. The difference actually between the private equity and raising a debt is the asset that you have to pledge for the debt, whereas you don't have to pledge for the private equity. But when you take the interest rate versus the payback that you have to do for the private equity, there's a quantum difference. Is that all the difference or is there anything else that is involved? No, you're right because, you know, equity is always expensive than debt. So it's an always an expensive. It's always expensive. So basically, you know, okay. what I would like to add here is, you know, if you have m a huge expansion plan, so you typically take equity from the private equity guys, based on that equity, you can raise debt and you can have a corpus, which is a huge corpus and you can then ramp up the would operations. That, would that be permitted by the private equity Why fund not? to raise debt mm -hmm. from yeah, the bank as well as... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, in fact, that is the model. So you yeah, get a typical debt equity ratio of 2 to 1, correct me if I'm wrong, and something similar to that. And then you raise equity from them, you raise debt from the bank and have a bigger corpus. I think that's the model the players in India are playing, at least, to my knowledge. So you correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, so leverage always helps you, you know, shore up your returns. So. If we come in, we'll, we'll and guide then you. And you have manner. a com combination of that, the overall, uh, uh, you know, what you're paying up. becomes reasonable. But I think uh, the concept that, you know, in case of a bank, you have to give uh, assets, uh, you know, uh, to the mortgaged. Here, you know, sorry, you'll probably have to give your life mortgaged. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> player, uh, it's, a, it's a much riskier and a much, uh, you know, bigger stake game when you go to a private equity because they at the end of the day are responsible for their own uh, investors and they would want return at any cost. I, I, I have one. Uh, like you said, that equity guys would like to have a buyback option from the promoter. So is it something like prenup we have in US that you have an agreement and pre-negotiated cost? Yeah, everything is prenup. So uh -huh. that is what you do. So yeah. And uh, the cost to uh, the divorcee is much higher than the one who is seeking it. 
Not necessarily. No? It, it depends. It depends on, you know, uh, which trajectory you take. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I really learned a lot. My name is Ali Java. I'm a medical professional uh, converting into a medical planner. I think I'm in the transition. What I really like the categorization of first hospital, your own money, second is the money of your family and friends, and the third is uh, from a bank. The second one, I, many people I think don't scale up because they don't have their own money. But when they have family and friends to fund it, then I think I like the idea that you operate, the doctor should operate, and they built uh, the infrastructure is built by the family who are not technical. What are the typical kind, how do you revenue sharing, have you, has it, is it common? Is it commonly done like that? Or, and if it is, what are the usual, how do they share the revenues after the hospital is functioning? So I, I yeah, might take a stab at that. So ahead. I wouldn't quite say that it always boils down to your non-doctor family is gonna fund your thing or your friends. Uh, let's talk about things in terms of one is operations and one is the property. Okay, so I was earlier talking about an operating company, property company model, and uh, our colleagues at Fortis over here are very well versed with this in the sense that you know you can have uh, your assets built up and you know have a value ascribed to that towards that. Where in other markets internationally, you could have real estate investment trusts, which actually take over that entire asset and then you pay them an operating fee. Fortis tried to do it via Relegare where they had an external entity in Singapore buy each of the, one of the assets for about 100 crores and then extracted an operating fee from these guys. But, you know, for lack of better terms, you know, it's not just the entrepreneurs who are looking for these types of opportunities. It's actually the bigger corporates because why it makes the most sense. That go somewhere where, number one, is there a coal shell over there? Number two, can I specify my requirements to the guy? Number three, is he going to fund it? Number four, am I going to come up with a lease which over let's say a 10 year period or something is gonna be economical to me vis-a-vis -vis actually setting up that actual asset by myself and is it gonna be economic to the other person as well. So I think you know, the reality is that uh, with major players like Narayan, Rudeli, et cetera, almost exclusively I would say about 60% expanding on this route, there's clearly benefit to having a name in terms of operations and scale. It's slightly harder for you as a smaller person to actually do that. Um, but yes, you can separate property and, and, uh, and operations. It's just very tough to do on a one hospital basis. Um, and it's tough to do if you're not a corporate player. But you know, so lease model is a REIT model. You know, again, if you go on for a lease model, it's like a REIT. Right. Uh, REIT has an yield, you know, so uh, does, you know, so ultimately it boils down to uh, the way we do, uh, you know, uh, your property valuations. You know, if you go to Gurgaon, you know, the expectation of, is about eight nine percent on a on a commercial property. So REIT is similar to that. So when you go and acquire, when you go in for a lease model with a hospital, you have to value the asset and then you pay a particular yield, which could be seven percent, could be eight percent, nine percent on the value of the property. You look at you know what are the economics that you think you can generate and how does that rental peg against the revenue that you will be making? Is it five percent, six percent, seven percent? So that's how you you look at those numbers. And I can tell you one thing. Uh, you know, growth is not limited by paucity of capital. If you are a good doctor and if you are a good manager, there are models by which you can put up your first hospital, second hospital, third hospital. And ultimately private equity will, will come to you because there are doctors in NCR who, you know, obviously with their team, they are doing 100 crores of revenue. They themselves are an institution, 100, 125 crores. Right. So if you are a good practitioner and if you are a good manager, when I say good manager means, you know, if you, if you have confidence in your skill set, if you are able to attract talent, attract talent means getting junior doctors beneath you, under you. And if you are able to create a formidable team where juniors want to work with you, the problem is in the doctor community, everybody wants to do everything himself, mm -hmm. you know. And that is where you lose the, the foresightedness. You're not a good manager because you don't have confidence in the team and that plays out when you start a hospital. Yep. So if you are a good, ho good doctor, which is your clinical skill set and, and your managerial skill set, you will build a solid team under you. And if you have a solid team, even within one hospital, and we've seen examples, you will be able to gain so much of footfall that 
fam leave aside families friends and friends will come and you know they will set up a hospital for you you don't you just need to pay rentals and rentals i can tell you those kind of rentals would be 1 or 2 or 3% of your revenue yeah. so paucity of capital never comes in way of growth if you are a good doctor good manager you will be able to reach a point where the entire investment community will come and want to invest in you yeah. and and just to encourage all of you you know i don't i don't think that this whole thing that doctors are not good managers etc is a real rule of thumb because at the end of the day if you look at finance you know i mean i'm an economist that's a different story in india majority of engineers and civil engineers etc they all start looking at this right so if a civil engineer can look at finance why can't a doctor it's not that he doesn't have as technical of a brain it's just that you need to little bit get out of the mindset that all i'm only about sitting in the operating theater i'm only about having my asymmetric relationship with the patient towards where i need to manage the entire 360 degree of the patient as well as increase that in scale in a manner in which the quality and the kind of trueness of that interaction doesn't really go down so there's whole i mean you know <clears throat> it's it's a it's a misnomer and it gets used a lot in healthcare doctors can't be good businessmen i mean if engineers can be good finance guys why can't doctors yeah so you know what so we'll the, 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 the clarity is that you know uh, i just want to clear what one thing doctors doesn't need to be good finance managers doctors need to be good managers yeah. and management man, managing somebody doesn't come by the way of education it is inbuilt you know you can demonstrate management even at an age of 7 years if you're taking people along with you you are a good manager so and it doesn't require any formal education and if you are a good manager you will have a good finance guy working for you yeah. and that's what funds look for is operations so it's a stage of investment venture capital is more early stage private equity is generally used for growth stage so uh, venture capital uh, you know they come in at a stage which is much more riskier than a stage in you know at which a private equity comes so and the returns expectations are you know a bit different vc would expect a higher return p private equity would expect so we should take uh, no no i think you no, got no. it wrong i think uh, venture capital is for more for the startup or for the first thing where the risks are more so they are expecting a higher return mm -hmm. when you are a stable operation and you have to scale up then the private equity guys come in at a later stage and definitely debt is already there you know you uh, even when you raising equity you may need debt for completing over cost of the project so we'll take one last question from here because we are already exceeding time uh, the most important question question or the topic which was not discussed is the every i and every i debt funding will you kindly throw some light on Sorry, that can, can you uh, come again on that foreign direct investment fdi fdi and foreign direct yeah, yeah. investment in terms of debt funding in terms of Huh. He's saying FDI in debt funding has it come to India? Not FDI directly FDI. So, so, so FDI in both forms have come to India in yeah. healthcare sector. So, uh, F F FDI. No, so uh, uh, private equity investment is a FDI. Mm -hmm. We are a foreign fund, so when we make investment, we file. Uh, But there must be some procedure or details for procedure difficulties. Uh, uh, no, there is none. There is none. There are Quite some often. some post investment filings that need to be done with RBI. Yeah. But it's an automatic route and. It's insignificant route. in the overall scheme of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's regulated with the fund have to do. So. Just uh, the Mankes uh, Hospital did in Bombay, that hundred crore rupees uh, some project he did, you know, and that uh, doctor couldn't manage that. He suffered from that heart attack. That is the one required by Reliance. Okay. So that uh, at that time, if the foreign funding was there, then he would have survived. What that's because he got too much in there. Was a big time to overshoot. <coughs> The, this has happened in multiple other sectors, including in edu. I mean, one thing which I wanted to answer: a sector which is very similar to this is education, where chains of schools are set up, colleges are set up, first one, and then they multiply. And there, this what in education is called the joint venture model. The real estate is with somebody, the op operating or the the education partner is somebody else. Very similar. So the real estate guy either enters into a real uh, lease agreement or a revenue share agreement. People prefer the revenue share because your upfront cost. The moment you have lease. Whether you are earning or no, you are, uh, you have to keep uh, paying out a fixed fee. So people prefer a revenue share that as your revenue grows, he is also more making profit. more. So on the long run, the guy makes more money. Both of them profit. Yes.
So I think you know we are already exceeding time. So Faizan is there. You know, uh, every time give He's me, been me trying. A, uh, give me a timeout signal. So we'll close here. Uh, you know, I would like to thank uh, each of the panelists, and I'll call Sylvan here to you know present the moment to to the panelists. And thank you so much, all of you, each and every delegate who has come here. And on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you all for taking out your time. And definitely, we have exchanged our cards, and we can stay connected, and we can take all the discussions again going forward. So thank, thank you so much. Uh,